Hello, AP World History students. Uh, welcome. So we have our lesson today, 2.4. Uh, we're here in the period 1450 to 1750. And, uh, and our topic today is the age of exploration. And this is a, a famous topic, of course, and, and it has named, you know, we kind of got it started last time with Jung He and Vasco da Gama. And, uh, and there's names that you've heard of, you know, from this period of time and Columbus, certainly first and foremost. And Magellan, maybe James Cook, and all these other folks. Um, but today, uh, we will look at the Columbus story in particular. That's a very that's a very key moment and a key individual in this. But I think we're going to, in general, look at broader processes and trying to understand uh, what was happening uh, with Europe's exploration, how that worked, and like what the biggest effects of it were. All right, so let's uh, let's jump in with with this. Um, one of the things we're going to be learning about here in this period of time, 1450 to 1750, is these huge empires, these, these large European states or large states worldwide. And, and this map here uh, gives you some sense of like the largest political entities uh, in this period. Um, and the big ones, uh, or at least the ones, uh, some of them that we're really going to focus on here in this period of time are what are called the maritime empires. Uh, Spain, Portugal, England, uh, the Netherlands, France to some extent. Uh, so these are like uh, European nations that, that establish overseas colonies that are a part of their empire, uh, part of their way of helping them prosper. And so this age of exploration really, uh, it's really points to how they created that, all right? There are also these uh, land-based empires and the next couple lessons will actually focus more on those uh, those guys. Uh, so I'll set that aside for a moment. So today's idea of these uh, the exploration that sets the table for these big maritime European maritime empires uh, in this period of time. That's that's where we're going. But just imagine for a second. <coughs> pardon me. Imagine for a second that you had you got a uh, an LEQ prompt, all right? And an LEQ prompt. You you look at the topic and it's something about. Uh, the age of exploration, right? Or uh, uh, comparing um, exploration efforts between, let's say, Europe and China or something like this. My question for you is, how would you contextualize that? Pause for just a second and think. What, how, what, would, I, what would be a process that I could go backwards in time in the period, let's say from 1200 to 1450, where I'd say, well, I would tell the story of this because that really leads into Europe's exploration. Can you think of anything? Or can you think of anything that we've already studied here from 14, uh, 12, uh, 1450 to 1750 that's maybe not in the theme uh, or not within the, the prompt topic of, of, of exploration, but it's something that's happening in Europe that is really shaping these efforts, all right? Can you think of something there? Either of those ideas, if you can give me a couple sentences on that, uh, either of those would work to sort of bring contextual meaning to this topic. All right, so just a bit of contextualization, uh, contextualization thinking exercise. Can you stop and think, if this was my topic, what would I write a contextualization passage about? If you're not sure, email me, but I'm just putting that out in front of you. All right, uh, let's start here. This is the map that Christopher Columbus used to plan his first voyage. And you look at this and you say, yeah, you know, uh, like I might, <laughs> to a young student or one of my kids, you know, my my uh, six-year-old, I'd say, well, you know, hey, that's a great start, man. Uh, I'm proud of you. Look at that. You got Europe. Uh, Europe looks pretty all right there. Um, I'm not so sure about all the rest. You know, Africa, we're going to work on that a little bit. You know, like there is a sense of there is so much to learn about the rest of the world. All right. And I think that's, that's actually kind of a wonderful place to put yourself in the mind of just sort of imagining if the world was, if, if there was so much unknown about the world and, and, and what sort of curiosity would drive you. And that's where we're going to that's where we're going to pick this up, all right? So Portugal, when we last left off, Portugal has uh, gotten off to the early lead in these efforts. Uh, thanks to uh, Vasco da Gama largely in completing this process of going around uh, Africa to get to the Indian Ocean trade network, um, Portugal is off to this early lead and they are cashing in. Spain, pardon me, <laughs> uh, anyway, Spain wants in on this. Spain is a rival nation. They're right there on the Iberian Peninsula with Portugal. Spain has sort of been occupied, let's put it that way. They've been sort of completing this whole other process called the Reconquista. And um, the Reconquista is a, is a nasty process of like the reconquest of, of Spain. Um, the reconquest meaning like conquering it, 
um, conquering the, the, the Muslim Moors that had controlled sort of parts of the Iberian Peninsula for, well, for a long, long time. Uh, and then it also sort of turned to like driving out uh, Jews. Uh, and this is, this is kind of, this is, so it's basically like religious wars going on in Spain. That's, that's the category you can put it in. Um, and these are led by uh, Spain's monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella, who are uh, deeply devout uh, Catholics uh, in a certain sense, and certainly devoted to the Catholic Church, let's put it that way. Uh, and so they, um, they want in on this process. Of, of They also want access to the Indian Ocean trade network. They don't want uh, Portugal to have this monopoly. And we learned last time that Portugal was kind of blocking out other countries by having all these sort of uh, trade fortresses and trade ports that they were controlling on the African coast. And so Spain walks, w wants in. Um, and we're going to see, you know, Spain gets lucky on some level. They just get lucky. Uh, but also what happens is the Portuguese thinking about this is inflexible. The Portuguese think they've got the situation figured out when they don't, all right? And their inflexibility will hurt them. Long term, Spain will become similarly inflexible, and that inflexibility will hurt them. Maybe we learned last time that China's inflexibility in the, in the, in the, in the situation with the, in, during the Ming Dynasty regarding Zheng He, maybe that hurt them. Um, so this is the context. Spain wants in. Portugal has the early edge. Uh, this is where we meet uh, Christopher Columbus. Um, so Columbus is a, a, a sea captain, a mariner. Uh, he is Italian, um, but he's kind of, uh, he's, he's looking for a, uh, a patron, I guess you could just say. He's looking for someone who will pay for him to go on these voyages, right? Who will provide him, who will furnish him with the stuff he needs. And he says, I, I believe I can make this pay off for you. But he has this obsessive interest in a trying to reach Asia by sailing west. Now, I, you probably know this already. I'm just saying it just to make sure that we all know it. Um, there was not a popular belief that the world was flat and Columbus wanted to prove that the world was, was round. Now, were there, were, there, were there people who thought the world was flat? Yeah, sure, of course there were. I mean, there, there still kind of are today on the internet. That's, like, <laughs> that's still a thing somehow. But anyway, you know, Columbus is not trying to prove that the world was round. The world was understood to be a sphere by by thoughtful people across Europe. That's, that's okay. That wasn't anything. That, what, that particular idea wasn't new. Um, it was just uncharted, and what was unknown was how big the world was. Right? And nobody had a conception that, that, the, that planet Earth was as big as it actually is. Uh, and so Columbus has this idea of, I want to uh, reach Asia by sailing west, and I've made these calculations, and the gamble is... Um, I'm going to go and I can, in, this, in this, these size ships, I can fit this much food and fresh water. And my gamble is I'm going to try to reach Asia before I run out of those. Right? That's just the gamble. That's the risk. And the people I'm going to take with me are the people who would be willing to sort of you know, re stick out their necks in a similar kind of gamble. The Portuguese turn him down. That is their big mistake, right? But the Portuguese turn him down because they say, no, nah, we've already got our route to, to uh, the Indian Ocean trade network. Spain, uh, initially in the Reconquista, is like, no, 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 we're busy. This, is, this just seems a little far-fetched. This is, we're looking for more secure investments, right? Um, but Portugal, or, pardon me, but uh, Columbus is an insistent son of a gun. And, uh, and he kind of keeps returning. He keeps asking. Eventually, Spain gives him three pretty small ships. Like a, they say, we'll send you with, you ain't getting a fleet, let's put it that way. You're getting a small investment, and we'll see what we can make work. And he sails west, and uh, the voyage itself has, is, is a marvel of a story uh, just in and of itself. Uh, and it does exhibit um, skill and bravery in what Columbus did. Um, we're going to learn that. Not all parts of Columbus's legacy are, are admirable, certainly. But there's skill and bravery in his voyage and in his plan. He does make landfall in the, uh, in the Caribbean. Um, in what is, he calls it Hispaniola. Uh, today it's uh, the islands of... Uh, of Dominican Republic, of, of the Dominican Republic in Haiti. That's that's where he lands. Um, something you're going to do after this video is read a letter that Columbus wrote um, on his return voyage, uh, and they they will sort of stop at a small island off the coast of Africa, and Columbus will send this letter ahead to Ferdinand and Isabella. So he's like, I want this letter to reach them first, and then I'll be arriving in a, in several weeks, 
and uh, it's going to be a big a big show. Uh, and so this is the letter. So you'll get a chance to read portions of that letter. And I'm going to ask you for your reactions and, and what had made the trip a success, according to Columbus. You'll get a chance to engage with that. Now, um, it's a strange thing. All right, so Columbus goes. He, of course, he believes he's reached... Um, He's reached Southeast Asia, right? He's reached the islands outside of uh, some islands in Southeast Asia is what he's believed he's reached. Um, and uh, this, this is where the term in the Indians comes from. This is a misnomer. Uh, it's a, they're, the people groups in North America are misnamed as a result. It's, you know, uh, so today Native Americans is used or we can say indigenous peoples of America. And many groups will just say Indians. Uh, we're not going to get too hung up on that in our course. But just know that the term Indian is a misnomer because Columbus was um, confused about where he was. Now, I don't look at that and say, what an idiot. Like, why would he believe he was anywhere else, right? Like, every, the data was just like, okay, like this is fitting with like we've now reached Asia, right? The trick was, as they kept taking in more data, it just wasn't matching up with this sort of schema in his head, right? So, like, he goes, he goes out the first time, and as you'll read, he comes back with some stuff, but not really the luck. The, it wasn't like Vasco da Gama, where he came back, he's like, I got everything, right? That, that's not what happens. He's like, I got some interesting stuff, and here's some, uh, here's some Indians, and uh, here's, you know, some rhubarb, you know. <laughs> he doesn't have, like, amazing stuff to show off. Ferdinand and Isabella say, okay, so this time, next time, we're going to give you like 17 ships and it's going to be great and we're going to send you out and we want you to come back all loaded up. We hit India, will you? And, uh, and he goes and he's kind of sailing all over the place and everyone's like, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're, tr we're struggling with the language. We can't get this figured out. Uh, he sets up a colony on Hispaniola. Uh, he has his brother govern it. Um, he keeps sort of returning, and they get. To, they eventually make it to Central America, right? They make. They even make it to what is today Venezuela and South America. And Columbus is like, I can't. Maybe we're in the Garden of Eden. Is sort of his thinking, right? Uh, he also, you know, um, he and his brother are pretty brutal in the way they rule their um, their colony. Uh, this like young colony, this sort of outpost colony on, on what they called Hispaniola. It's, it's pretty brutal what they were doing there. Um, and actually he gets recalled and sent back to Spain and sort of fight Ferdinand and Isabella, kind of cut ties with him. And it's, uh, he sort of ends his life and his career in ignominy. You know, he's just like uh, sort of disgraced in some sense. And, and he's sort of you know, frustrated and felt thwarted. It's a strange, it's a strange end for such, fateful, for such a fateful moment. But now for the first time, right, uh, shortly, after, shortly after these voyages, now we're looking at European understanding of the world is improving, right? Not only do they have some sense of Africa and what that is and its relationship with the Indian Ocean, but they have some sense of we've got some big landmass over here. And there's a, not only is there an Atlantic Ocean, but there's an ocean on the other side as well. Now, this pattern we're going to see play out a lot here as we look at maritime empires. We have a mother country. In this case, mother country would be Spain. And they send out explorers, like in this case, Columbus, but there's many others. And as I'm doing this, guys, I want there's this question here. Consider what were the motivators for each group? Why, why is the mother country doing this? Why are explorers going out? Along with the explorers come the conquistadors. The conquistadors are these sort of uh, cutthroat, ruthless soldiers, right? Warriors, battle-hardened. In the case of uh, Columbus, they're kind of battle-hardened from the Reconquista. And the Reconquista was such a nasty war. On some level, Ferdinand and Isabella are like, you've got these kind of frothing at the mouth, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, ultra-Catholic <laughs> warriors. And you're like, and they're sitting there on, on the Iberian Peninsula. And Ferdinand and Isabella are sort of like, why don't you guys uh, go somewhere else and, and you know, do, do, some fight, do some fighting elsewhere. And that's a little bit of what's going on. And they want the glory. They want the gold. They want the, the, the fighting for God, all this stuff in their, in their ideology. Um, missionaries will go, go with the conquistadors. So we'll learn about that uh, in a future lesson. But the missionaries are often there to kind of soften the conquistadors. It's like, let's also tell them about Jesus. Hold on, before we kill them, you know, let's, uh, we want to we wanna soften this up or have some humanitarian or humane element to it. And the, and the missionaries were sometimes like the only force kind of holding back the conquistadors from what they were doing. Um, eventually, you would have permanent settlers moving in that are sort of seeking to you know, uh, improve their financial prospects, perhaps, or or benefit the mother country. They're sort of going with after the initial conquest is done and the settlement has has begun. And at a certain point, you end up with 
a colony, right? An official European colony, and that colony will begin to benefit the mother country for reasons we're gonna, in ways we're gonna study as we move ahead. So this becomes like a handy, neat pattern. And if you can kind of understand this, you're just gonna understand a lot of the stories we're gonna cover here, not only in this period of time, but in the next period of time too. Now, Columbus doing this thing of going and, and um, ending up in America, right? And sort of, and, and making landfall there and beginning this process of connections um, sets off uh, the Columbian Exchange, which is one of the, the biggest world-shaking uh, processes that's, that's ever occurred. And this is a simple chart that tries to start to give you, give you some sense of like what is about to happen, right? But it's sort of like two, the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere have both been sort of vacuum sealed, right? They are airtight and cut off from each other. And the moment that Christopher Columbus lands and wades out of the water and meets some of these Tainos people that he called that the, that he calls them and says, you know, <coughs> hey, I'm Christopher Columbus. Nice to meet you, right? And shakes some hands. It's like the vacuum seal comes off and it's like <laughs> suddenly suddenly there's this dramatic exchange going in each direction, right? And the exchange will be uh, biological, it will be human, it will be ecological. There's all kinds of stuff that is just sort of like immediately just sort of like firing back and forth and the americas will be changed permanently as a result and afro-eurasia will be changed permanently as a result i want you to look at some of the stuff we see here all right and my question that i ask is what would you predict which of these are the biggest game changers not all of these are are equally significant or equally important they're all, I should say, they all are significant, but some of these will absolutely change history in, in dramatic ways, and some of them are just lovely, right? Or some of them just make life a little bit better or a little bit worse. Uh, so uh, as you're thinking about that, I'd say I definitely point you to disease. Disease is uh, one of the biggest game changers, and it's going to have, it's going to wreak havoc in the Americas. And of course, there's many more diseases in Afro-Eurasia, as you learned in Guns, Germs, and Steel, because there was much more animal domestication in Afro-Eurasia, and most of our diseases come from contact with animals. All right. Now, there were some, uh, there were some diseases that came from the Americas to, uh, to Afro-Eurasia, syphilis for one, uh, which is a... Uh, uh, an STD, and that, uh, true to human nature, that spreads extremely quickly throughout um, Afro-Eurasia. Afro so it's not like there's no diseases that went the other way. Other things I would point you to. Um, how about going the other way? Let's point to uh, the potato. You might not grab that one, but the potato is a huge game changer. The potato is a game changer because it is a super rugged, um, high-calorie plant. Uh, potatoes are... Uh, they can be grown anywhere. They can be grown in, in the nastiest, rockiest soil. Uh, and it, it means that all kinds of land that had not really been especially ripe for agriculture now is usable for agriculture and it can produce a lot of calories, which as you start thinking, what does that mean? Well, start thinking, what does that mean? And what will that mean in Afro-Eurasia? All right, so this transfer is just so dramatic, all right? It, it really will, it will, it will shift life everywhere, all right? And if we're looking for big effects, which is always like, you know, uh, always what we should be doing. So let's imagine we're, we're asked to write about the effects of, you know, uh, Columbus's voyage to the Americas. The biggest thing you'd root that around is the, is the Columbian exchange. And you'd say things like, you know, the native population, uh, the indigenous population of North and South America is, is gravely har harmed, ravaged. Difficult to know exactly, but, you know, um, it, you know, here's an estimate that you see a fair amount, like within 100 years, uh, it, will, it will wipe out 90% of the, pop, the indigenous population in North and South America, that plus the wars that are going to take place. Just grave damage. Um, uh, the, uh, the food that came from the Americas um, uh, led to a population boom. Um, and so I mentioned potatoes, but you could put corn in there as well, or tomatoes, uh, any of the other ones, uh, beans, squash, all this stuff. Um, and that is uh, improving uh, nutrition. That's making Europeans, not just Europeans, Europeans, Africans, Asians, everyone in between, all of Afro-Eurasia, it's a healthier diet. There is more nutrition that's available. It's more diversified, which means it's reduced susceptibility to 
to uh, disease and hunger. So like just population is going up. There's also this like mass migration of people that's happening. Less from the Americas to Afro-Eurasia, that happened to some small extent, but to a very large extent, people from Afro-Eurasia to the Americas. Some of them voluntary, some of them involuntary, right? That's pointing ahead to the African slave trade. That's a nasty piece that's gonna be coming soon enough. But, and that will result in a, in a whole new level of cultural mixing, racial mixing, syncretism, all this stuff is gonna be coming because of what's just happened. So if I try to chart this out simply, we have this uh, Colombian exchange, uh, and I'm, I always like to mention potatoes in specific just because even think to yourself, how many things do I eat in a given week that are potato-based? It's kind of a lot, right? And I could grow potatoes here in my classroom carpet if I needed to. It's just like they are a rugged plant. Uh, that leads to better nutrition. Uh, epidemic disease has less impact when there, is a, when there is a healthier populace. There is a rise in population. Cities begin to grow. And we are moving, uh, that is, we are moving toward modernity. All right, that's what's happening. We are moving into a modern period, helped along by all this stuff in the Colombian exchange. All right. Now, Spain and Portugal are not the only nations exploring. So I want to finish with just a last thought on what, what, are, what we'll categorize as northern, uh, northern efforts. All right. uh, the French are going to jump in. Uh, the English will jump in. The Dutch will jump in. Um, let's talk about uh, the French and the English. Well, let's talk about the Dutch first for a second. The Dutch have a, so the, the Netherlands is fighting this interesting struggle. We're not in AP European history, so we don't need to worry too much about this, but, but uh, the Dutch had been under the control of, Netherlands had been under the control of Spain, believe it or not. And they're sort of fighting their own, um, they're fighting for their own independence uh, during this period of time. And that's a long, complicated struggle. We don't really need to worry about, but I will say that for the Dutch to kind of poach or, or snag, uh, there's the Dutch pirates, you can even think of them as, as to sort of snag um, seaports from the Spanish um, was a part of that sort of effort to win independence from Spain. They're also going to start snagging uh, seaports or poaching them from the Portuguese. They called themselves sea beggars. And on some level, it's just like, look, we're just sort of taking what we can find. But they will eventually establish quite a uh, quite a, a remarkable network of, of mostly trade outposts. The Dutch aren't going to set up big colonies in lots of places, but they will control trade outposts and cities and trade ports that they will use to sort of create this whole network of trade or monopolize a trade network that they are kind of monopolizing and in control of that's going to lead to some incredible wealth for them in just a little bit. And just consider as I'm telling you this story, Remember, I said one of the key aspects of Europe is that it's decentralized and divided up. How are we seeing Europe's decentral, uh, decentralized political state play a major effect in its exploration story? Right? Um, Northern Europe, uh, Northern European nations were key. To, they were keen to try to find what they called a, a Northwest Passage, which was. Um, a way to get to the Pacific Ocean without having to go all the way south around South America. Uh, now that because moving south around South America, you're in Portuguese and Spanish territory. Also, it's just blasted long, and so there must be some way, some river or strait or channel or passage that's going to allow us to go no a northerly route to get to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, that's through more friendly territory. Now, of course, we know that doesn't really exist, but that did lead to uh, significant exploration of North America by the French and the English in particular. Um, and the French and the English, you know, unlike the Spanish, uh, are not going to strike it rich with gold. Uh, we'll learn about Spain striking it rich with gold uh, in a future lesson, but they're not going to strike it rich with gold. Uh, what they'll find instead are like lumber, furs, um, and of course, these in the Caribbean, you can grow sugar. That will be a huge game changer we'll learn about. So they're, they're cashing in in other ways. It's not maybe quite as initially lucrative, but we know the long this term picture here. I'm, I'm sitting here speaking English to you in Minnesota. Like long term, English colonial efforts will be extremely successful. It's just a little slower going at first. Uh, the, uh, the last thing I want to note about these northern ventures is that the English and the Dutch have just sort of different political traditions and um, their, their kings have less total authority. And so they kind of outsourced a lot of these efforts to private companies. And this will become a really key part of their story. These private companies, um, the two of them are the big ones, the, the Dutch East India Company, or, or VOC are the initials for that in Dutch. Um, so the, the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company 
are these two private companies that are established with the uh, with the sort of mission. Their business model is to uh, make trade connections, capture and control trade ports, and sort of control trade and bring in trade goods. These have become two of the wealthiest companies in the world over the next century or two. So that's uh, it's worth uh, it's worth noting and being introduced to them right there. All right, we've done a whole bunch today. Thank you guys for hanging in there. Um, so after this lesson, af after learning about exploration, the next pieces are learning about the empires themselves. So we'll learn about land-based empires and maritime empires, but that's coming up in the future. For right now, we'll do a reading check to review and a couple of the pieces for today's lesson. Have a good day, guys.